We're looking at an apparent tactical shift in Syria's bloody civil war as rebels expand their weaponry and increase military action. I'm Peter Lapman, and you're watching The New York Times. Later in the show, we'll speak to Andrew Tabler, a Syria expert standing by in Washington. We'll also take a look at the life of a revolutionary sports figure here in the U.S. But first, we've got Ann Barnard on the line from Beirut for the latest details about a deadly bombing in Damascus. Good morning, Ann. Good morning. Um, so uh, we have a, a lot of news this morning regarding the conflict in Syria. Uh, first, uh, there was a, a twin car bombings in Damascus. Uh, what do we know? Well, some estimates say that as many as 50 people have been killed in a mostly minority section of the city that uh, has a lot of Christian and Druze relative, uh, residents. Um, and, and is this sort of an, uh, you know, a further escalation of the conflict? Is this, is this a different sort of turn in, in the violence that we've seen? Uh, what's interesting about this morning's news? Well... We have seen huge bombings like this in Damascus before, and this time, as in the past, the government has blamed this on terrorists. That's their uh, uh, moniker for all the people that are fighting against them. But uh, anti-government activists also say that many of their number were killed in this bombing. So there's a sense that the conflict is getting so out of control with so many different factions and tactics that uh, both sides can be harmed by the violence. Right. And this morning, there's a story in today's paper that you wrote uh, regarding potential uh, enhanced weaponry that the, re the rebels have acquired. And there's some videos online of helicopters being shot down that suggest that um, no longer they're just being shot down, but indeed they have acquired missiles. Uh, talk about that. Yes, that video that surfaced yesterday was significant because although we knew that the rebels had obtained some surface-to-air missiles, it was unclear whether they knew how to use them or had used them f effectively. This video seems to show a projectile that, that looks larger than a rocket-propelled grenade, which has been used in the past. This is the first time we've seen an actual video evidence of a surface-to-air missile being used. This is the kind of weapon that the rebels have been saying would help them turn the tide because of the government's almost unchallenged dominance in the air, uh, which is the biggest threat to the rebels. And, and how do... We, uh, what about the reliability of these videos? Uh, obviously, this is, you know, propaganda potentially being pushed by the rebels. Um, do, do we have, uh, are these authenticated videos? Well, throughout this conflict, uh, videos have been a weapon of war and a weapon of propaganda, as you say. There, uh, we've had military analysts look at these videos. Uh, there are some things that are probably hard to fake. Um, Again, we definitely would need more evidence and more incidents to confirm whether this is an isolated incident or just a lucky hit. And uh, has there been any international response? I mean, if they have acquired these weapons and these missiles, which are a lot more potent, um, you know, would that sort of precipitate um, some escalation in terms of the international community responding to this conflict? Well, I think it's almost the other way around. There, there has been um, a constant debate about whether to provide uh, these types of weapons to the rebels because there's a fear that if these weapons got into the wrong hands, they could be a regional threat. If they're not controlled by governments, they could be, control they could be used by militants against civilian airliners, against government targets in other countries. So the question has been whether the international community feels ready to supply these weapons to a rebel force that at the moment uh, is not completely organized or accountable. And thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. We'll turn now to Washington for further analysis of the civil war in Syria. Andrew Tabler is a Syria expert at the Washington Institute, and he joins me now from our DC bureau. We talked about uh, the bombing in Damascus, as well as a report that uh, rebels have acquired missiles to shoot down helicopters, which have been posted on the internet. Um, put this all in the context of the broader conflict. Well, there have been a number of videos released um, in the last two weeks showing that the rebels had overrun bases in Syria, which was widely reported and, um, and backed up by, uh, by anecdotal evidence as well. And in those videos, it showed that they had acquired some shoulder-fired, uh, specifically SA-7, um, um, what they're called man pads, um, essentially very rudimentary stingers, a late 60s, early 70s technology. So that could account for with the downing of the helicopter we saw yesterday. 
or it could be that some of these uh, weapons have been delivered by foreign governments into Syria, um, uh, specifically in the last couple of weeks following the Doha conference, um, which unified the opposition. Hmm. And, and then we have a, a twin car bombings in Damascus this morning, in which there are some reports saying that as many as 50 people uh, were, were killed. Um, uh, tell us uh, how, how, that, how that act of violence might fit into the broader issues here. Well, Jaramana, the area of the bombing is um, populated by Druze and Christians. Those are two minorities which are traditionally gathered around the Assad regime. Um, and uh, it's most likely extremists um, who are uh, hell-bent on uh, trying to, to, to terrorize the minority population. Um, and uh, it's really unclear exactly who's responsible. Um, some people in the opposition think that it's the regime that does this, that actually <laughs> strikes fear among the minorities and gets them to huddle around the core Alawite sect, uh, the, the sect from which the Assad uh, family hails. So we really don't know, but it's a horrific bombing, and it's one of a number that we've had since the beginning of the uprising um, in uh, March of 2011. Yeah, and, and let's take a step back and, and talk about, um, you know, since the beginning of the uprising in the spring of, of last year, um, first of all, t how many deaths uh, have we seen? And also, just as we head into the end of the year there, um, here, uh, wh where, where might we see this uh, shifting or going to? Well, we're approaching about 45,000 uh, deaths. Um, there could be many more. I think that there are. Um, a lot of people have simply disappeared in, 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 into detention. Um, so we're looking at death rates um, now, which are around 5,000 a month. Um, it, it's accelerating. Uh, it's getting worse. The number of displaced persons is worse. The uh, number of refugee, refugee flows are markedly worse. Um, I just came from Syrian border areas in South Turkey. Um, you have a lot of people out in the open, uh, specifically across the Syrian border. Um, and uh, aid has struggled to get in. And um, unfortunately, stepping into um, uh, to the gap, to fill the gap there, have been a number of um, extremist organizations, um, uh, and this is what activists say, um, that they're, they're, they're quicker, they're more flexible to respond than Western governments, and, um, and they're gaining some allies. So, um, so certainly things along the border with Syria uh, don't look good. Yeah, and talk about uh, the international response. I mean, not only from where you are in Washington, but the broader uh, you know, international community. Well, it's divided into two. You have the response of the Arab countries, um, which is an outreach to the political opposition, which we saw in Doha recently. Um, and, uh, and then also uh, those countries, specifically Qatar, have been uh, working with military councils within Syria, with the armed opposition. The West um, does not generally work with the, mil the armed units, specifically the United States. The United States takes a very clear line away from, from uh, armed groups. Uh, we thought that was going to change after the election uh, in November here in the States. Uh, it didn't. Uh, it seems that the Obama administration is uh, set to set this one out. Um, unfortunately, though, it seems as if the armed groups are going to be those that are taking power in Syria. And it's unclear exactly, um, since the Obama administration has stayed out of this, what kind of um, influence or leverage they're going to have over these groups um, as they take over parts of the country. Andrew, thank you so much for coming on this morning. It's my pleasure. Finally, we'll shift gears and turn away from the conflict in Syria to note the passing of a major sports figure here in the United States. Marvin Miller changed professional sports by helping build baseball's player union. Rich Sandermere is here from her sports desk. Good morning, Rich. Hi, Peter. How are you? So um, there's a lot of coverage about Marvin Miller this morning. There's an obit. You have a nice story about whether he should be in the Hall of Fame or not. And then Faye Vincent, the former commissioner, has a, a wonderful remembrance uh, of his old friend. But there's another article in the Times about Andy Pettit's uh, contract, the Yankees pitcher, and that even though he went five and four last year, he's going to sign a $10 million contract for next season. And based on everything I read this morning, it seems like he has Marvin Miller to thank for that. Oh, virtually every player has Marvin Miller to thank for their contracts. You know, uh, the average salary was so small in 1966, and now it's so big, over $3 million uh, a year. You know, one year, $10 million, well, that's a great... Uh, it's, it's one of the legacies of Marvin Miller that players are paid maybe more than what they're worth. Back when he took over, they were under they were underpaid and they were bound by the reserve clause, which basically meant the owners could keep them in renewable one-year deals. 
and there was no freedom. Right. You hear the phrase indentured servants yes. is effectively what they were. And take us back to the late 60s, early 70s, and what did Marvin Miller do to really change the way in which professional athletes were paid? Well, first he brought his skills as a trade unionist from the United Steelworkers Union to baseball. Players weren't used to this. Players were very wary of, wary of this. They were told for so many years that they should be happy to be paid for playing a, a little boy's game, but he won their trust. And by doing that, he got them united in three strikes, none of them as big as the one that killed the 1994 World Series, but he won arbitration, uh, grievance arbitration, salary arbitration, and then ultimately, probably the piece de resistance, winning free agency through arbitration. Mm. So, you know, by 1975, 76, everything had changed. And within 10 years, everything had changed. And, you know, there there will always be some owners who didn't join a free agency, but that became how one way the players were acquired. And baseball did not get economically ruined, as, as Bowie Kuhn, the commissioner at the time, uh, declared, as many owners declared. Uh, Marvin Miller changed everything, and he was, in effect, the real commissioner. Yeah, and um, one of the most professional, uh, powerful people in all of professional sports. Here we are in 2012, and there's uh, you know a hockey lockout, and there looks like there might not even be a hockey season. And we were talking before that this is directly attributable to a lot of the changes that Marvin Miller brought on. And certainly, the hockey union is led by Donald Feger, who was one of Marvin's successors, and was his gen and I believe was his general counsel for for for, for a brief time. Don learned the lessons of, of, of Marvin Miller, which was to earn the trust of your players. And certainly by the time fear came to the hockey union, they understood union, but they'd never been as effectively represented as they probably are now. Marvin Miller set that template, and he did it in a kind of an urbane, sophisticated, very wary and cautious way. He wasn't a blustering union guy. He didn't sit there with a big cigar in his mouth. He had a carefully manicured mustache. He was a very classy guy who became probably a darling for the press because he was available, he was immensely quotable, and he had a case to make that seemed so much more modern than the, than the ancient case of the owners who wanted to keep players in, 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 you know, stuck in the reserve clause. Yeah, it sounds like you and others had a really nice, uh, you know, both professional and personal relationship with him. And before we came on, you were telling me a, a fun story uh, involving Richard Dixon. Well, in 1966, Robin Roberts, one of the leaders in the Players Union who had, who had helped bring Marvin Miller into the fold, uh, said, uh, you know, we know you don't like his politics, but, would, but you know, Nixon is interested in the general counsel job. Would you go to, uh, to meet him? And Marvin Miller probably had no intention of hiring Richard Nixon, who was a Republican. Marvin was a Democrat. And so he, they, they go to, he goes to Nixon's apartment. They have a lovely conversation. Nixon never, Nixon never brings up the job. But he said, uh, Marvin, if you ever need my help, I know the owners very well. <laughs> and Marvin thought to himself, yeah, I bet you do. And uh, so they met three years later, and uh, after Nixon was president, and you know, Marvin wrote in his book, I'm glad to see he got, he got gainful employment by that time. It's a great story. Thanks so much for coming on this my morning, pleasure. Rich. That's all for now, but please join my colleague David Gillen at 1 p.m. for a look at media and technology. Stay with us at nytimes.com for more. I'm Peter Lapman, and you're watching the New York Times. Goodbye. Thank you.